So Justin, I'd like to start with you and uh, hear a bit about your story and how it all began. Can you take us back to, I suppose, where the business idea came from and how you launched it in the first place? Yeah, so uh, my wife and I were uh, looking for a different type of holiday. We'd done lots of stuff, lots of travel overseas, and um, we decided that we'd like to you know, do some stuff in Australia. Um, and she said, why don't we you know, go hire a caravan and, and you know, do something different for a Christmas holiday? Um, she'd never really been in a caravan before. Um, I'd done lots of it as a kid. Um, and I just started to look around at you know, what was available. Um, you know, in my little suburb that I'm in, my little neighbourhood, there's you know, probably a hundred that just sit there on the side of the road and never get used. Uh, and I just really couldn't find anything. There was, there was no centralised sort of marketplace for it. There was lots of little operators doing lots of stuff. And you know, I just sort of thought, there must be something like Airbnb for caravans, but yeah. it just didn't exist. So um, I kind of thought, well, you know, maybe this is something. I could do something with it. Um, started to sort of formulate it a little bit, how would it work? Um, and then the uh, NRMA and Slingshot had a, uh, a call for ideas to do a business accelerator program. Um, and I thought, well, why don't I apply and see if I get in? Uh, so I did filled out the application, hit submit, and then thought, oh, actually, I need a website. So I went and built the website that night as well um, as a landing page to um, uh, capture some signatures. Um, and then, um, you know, in that, um, in that kind of time, uh, they came back to us within a couple of days and said, why don't you come and pitch the idea and put a pitch deck together, um, then went to uh, the, went and pitched the idea. Uh, we actually were up against another uh, company that had exactly the same idea as us. Um, they were a little bit more advanced than us. They had um, an actual platform uh, and they had some, a few customers on the platform. Um, but um, I think we kind of impressed the guys with our marketing a little bit better than what they did. Yeah. Um, I think one of the questions they asked them was, how are you going to get customers? And they said, well, NRMA's got lots of customers, we'll just use yours. <laughs> so that's not what the NRMA wanted to hear. Um, and so, um, yeah, they, they offered us a spot in the program. Uh, there was uh, 10 of us in there. Um, and at the end of the program, which went for 12 weeks, we then uh, raised some capital to go and build the product. and. Where we went. So, did you were you working in a full time role before this, or how was that transition to kind of go into the accelerator from there? Yeah, so it all happened so quickly that, that I was in a full time role. So I was working for uh, a mining logistics software company. Um, uh, I was a startup itself uh, a, a few years before that, um, which we then floated on the stock exchange. Um, we had some big customers like Anglo American. We built lots of stuff for them uh, in Brisbane. So I was spent a lot of time in Brisbane. Um, and, and then, um, yeah, this kind of came up and was too good an opportunity to, to let go, so, so I moved on from there. Fantastic. And how did you two meet and when did Dave become involved? We met at a, um, like a business breakfast thing for, um, I can't remember what it was for really, but that's how we met and just started talking and he said, what do you do? And I said, oh, I've got this startup called Camplify and he said, oh, that's pretty cool. I said, what do you do? And he said, I'm a digital marketer and I went, oh, maybe we need you. And that was it. So. <laughs> the rest is history. Yeah. Yeah. I was just. Um, uh, thanks for coming, everybody, and, and thanks for having us, Louisa. I was uh, uh, leaving a job at the time, and I remember sitting next to him and having no idea what he meant by the whole concept, uh, and not not being a caravan person at the time. I'm thinking, uh, but you know, we got we got along pretty well. Uh, he um, didn't like the sound of paying paying me, which was fine, but <laughs> bought me lunches and stuff and. And yeah, we just probably hard, oh, all of our team had full-time jobs when we first started. So um, yeah, it kind of grew from there. And Dave, you still do have another business as well. We might just touch on that quickly while we're talking uh, about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've got the digital marketing agency in, in Newcastle and we're all in the same office, um, Campify and, and my company as well. So um, I definitely wouldn't recommend trying to do two things at once. <laughs> it was lots of um, uh, long hours and uh, and yeah, it's a bit of a grind, but um, we've kind of got through that and we've got, what have we got, 15, about a team of about 15 now and, and pretty much everybody is full time um, with Campify. So. so after the Accelerator program, like what was it for you out of that program that really helped you to kind of take the next step and, and do you credit that to the, the program that you were part of? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, it, it, without the program, it'd still probably be an idea on my whiteboard in my office. Um, it's kind of pushed me to actually 
do it and work out that you know, if I'm going to take money from somebody, which the whole program, you know, the idea is that you take some funding to help you grow your business, really. Um, and if I'm going to take someone's money, then I really have to make sure this thing works because yeah. I don't take anyone's money without making sure that I actually give them a return. Um, so, you know, that kind of pushed me and the other members of the team to actually make sure that it was successful. Um, and then, you know, having to make that decision to quit your job and go all in to something, um, you know, I've still got a mortgage to pay and, and everything else, so I had to make sure it, it, it did actually work. Um, so, you know, I think the program, the thing that um, we probably got the most out of the program was um, probably two things. One is the, the power of knowing your customers when you're trying to market to them. Um, and two is how to build something um, in small steps that actually satisfies your customers' requirements. Um, you know, I think that when I first started, I had a, a vision for what I wanted the platform to be. Um, and we quickly realised that uh, we can't wait for that whole platform to be built. We have to build, we had to build it in chunks and prioritise things um, that actually would deliver customer outcomes so that we could, we could grow the business um, at the same point as we were, we were building that software. Yeah, that, that certain reality around getting a product up. So what year was it that, this, that you were in the accelerator? Uh, it was the start of 2015. 15, yeah. Okay, and who else was involved in founding the business? Uh, so we had uh, four founders in total that went into the program. Um, uh, myself and my brother-in-law, who was our techie guy. Um, so he's a, you know, he was in uni, he still is in uni actually. Um, he's, uh, he's a developer. Um, and then we had yeah, two other guys that um, were more sort of business marketing people. Um, and they kind of made the decision towards the end of the program that they didn't want to give up their full-time jobs. They had careers. Um, they were kind of like, well, we like doing what we're doing. We don't want to commit to that. So they decided to drop out of the... Of the sure. Yeah. Okay, great. And your team now has grown to 15 people. So what does that look like in terms of who's involved? And I suppose, how did you grow? What were the first roles that you put on? The, the first person we put on was... Uh, uh, COO, but you know, basically he just did everything at that point. Um, and so, you know, he, his role essentially now is to uh, look at the operations of the Australian division in terms of, you know, the, the mechanical running of the business, you know, making sure that um, people are paid, that people have safe hires, that, you know, the, you know we've got all the connecting dots that we, we need to be able to ensure that the platform works for the customers. Yeah. Um, the next person we put on was uh, um, kind of like a, a marketing junior, but he's actually now grown into be um, our community manager. So um, through the process of working with us, he's gone out and bought his own camper van. He was the one in the, in the video that gave Chief a high five. That's his camper van. He um, bought that, built it. Um, he hires it out through our platform. He's made a stack load of money. And, and so he knows what you have to do as a customer um, to actually you know, do those things. So, so he now works with our other owners and helps them to do the same thing. Um, then we started to, to build a team of uh, customer service people. Um, and, and those customer service people are based uh, in both the Philippines and in Johannesburg. Um, so that gives us good coverage across different time zones. Um, and then, then we started to build uh, more of the technical team. So i uh, got a CTO, which we brought on board from um, NIB Health Fund. Uh, he was in charge of product development for them. So he came on board as our CTO and started to build out more, more tech, tech guys. And, and then you know, our team in the, in the UK, which we've just launched as well. Fantastic. And we will talk more about that as we go. How long was it between doing the Accelerator program and getting your first revenue? Uh, our first revenue came in August 2015. So it was about eight months, seven yeah. months. And how did you get your first customer? Was that a very hands-on process? It was the opposite. <laughs> our, our platform that we built to start with, um, I've been told, was the worst platform ever made, um, the most disgraceful user experience ever, uh, numerous things, and these are all by investors. Um, so um, we, basically everything was concierge in the back end. You know, we kind of um, did some stuff from membership sign-up, but everything was us in the background doing something and just making it look like a platform, really. Um, so yeah, it was very, very hands-on to, to actually get the two parties connected together and, and have that first hire. Yeah, 
great. Let's talk a little bit about funding. Um, what's the process been from you know from that accelerator program onwards in terms of raising funding? How, you've, how have you gone about it? And what have been some of your learnings from that process? Yeah, so I think because we did the accelerator program, we were lucky enough to um, have really good support in that fundraising um, process. So uh, the Slingshot program basically um, they now, which kind of was built on the back of what we did, um, they have a guaranteed um, dollar for dollar matching of VC funding for what you can go fund. So uh, we did, we went and did that. We found some angel investors, um, the venture capital fund invested in us, um, as well as NRMA, who was the corporate partner of, of that accelerator program. Um, so, um, yeah, touch wood, it was relatively easy to be honest with you. Like because we, we knew, went through the program, we knew exactly what we wanted, wanted to build. We knew kind of how to build it. Um, we knew what our revenue stream was going to be. Uh, it was just a matter of getting the, the money to do it. So, if your first customer sale was in August 2015, when did you bring? When did you raise that round? It, the, the, the round closed um, in about June 2015. So, it took about six months to actually ex execute the round. Mm. So, pre-revenue fundraising. Yeah, great. And since then, you've raised some further funding. What does that look like? Yeah, so we raised uh, that round closed, I think, in February, was it? Maybe? Yeah, about that. Yeah. Yep. Um, <laughs> I just spend the money on it, raise it. <laughs> uh, so uh, that was predominantly through a corporate partner again, who's um, uh, Apollo Tourism and Leisure. So they're the, the biggest um, uh, RV rental fleet in Australia. Uh, and they, they listed on the stock exchange back in December last year. Uh, and one of their first matters of business was to invest in us and, and purchase another business on the same day. So. Right, okay, so how does that relationship work and how does that overlap with what they're doing and what's that partnership like for you? Yeah, so I think the, the key uh, thing for us is that um, Apollo's got a huge amount of experience running rental fleets. Um, you know, I think that uh, they see that we are very good at tech and digital um, and so, uh, they can bring a lot of experience and advice into our business and help us in that side of things. Yeah. Um, at the same time, we can, we can do the same for theirs in terms of tech and digital as well. Um, and uh, we have something that uh, a rental fleet owner can never have, and that's distribution. So um, if a rental fleet wants to start up uh, in Brisbane, uh, they've got to go and invest the money in, in the rental fleet to do that. Uh, they've got to build, have a premise, they've got to build everything you know, they've probably got to invest, you know, two to five million dollars to do that. Um, you know, we can do that with some Facebook ads. Yeah, right. Very nimble. Yeah. Awesome. So let's uh, change tact a little bit and talk around marketing now. And obviously building a two-sided marketplace is always challenging. Um, how have you approached this, Dave, in terms of, you know, getting that off the ground? Uh, yeah, so um, as Justin sort of mentioned before, uh, uh, getting our first customer is quite a manual sort of um, process and I remember us sitting in uh, a basement at Newcastle Uni in, in Newcastle, um, just brainstorming how do we how do we do marketing, how do we how do we grow this thing? And half of our team was tech digital sort of people who wanted to just sit behind a computer and make customers come to our website, and the other half um, was a bit more practical. It was like, no, we have to talk to our customers. We have to figure out like who they are and what they want and and you know manually get them on on the platform so um, that's what it was early on um, we knew that uh, or we figured that we needed caravans and motorhomes on our site uh, otherwise when people would get to the site they'd have nothing to hire obviously so and early on we even had no listings present you had to sign up to see the two or three listings that were there um, so <clears throat> we knew that we needed uh, um, caravan owners, it was a lot of Facebook ads, it was Justin and I um, getting our face on video, doing video ads, localised video ads for every region in the country saying, hey, do you own a caravan, did you know you can earn this much money, this is what we do, and, and getting them to sign up. <coughs> um, what we learnt pretty quick was people, uh, for some reason people just didn't want to uh, sign up to an online service and, and put their $80,000 caravan on our site straight away. So. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why. Um, so we developed um, some le uh, lead magnets or lead capture tools. The main one is a calculator that um, that people can plug in the the type of RV they have, the births and all that kind of stuff, that region it's in, and it spits out um, 
an estimate of what they could earn. And that's our top of the funnel part. And then we do uh, email nurturing until they're comfortable, get on the phone to them. Um, our COO, Josh, is not, um, not the most tech savvy person, but he's very good at communicating and talking and just being a real person. And I think that that was like one of our big keys to gaining trust over some competitors who just wanted to do the, you know, build the awesome platform and not talk to anyone. So um, that was really key in, in building, you know, our small bunch of raving fans. If you've ever heard the Airbnb story, they really, they talk a lot about, um, and we just, you know, read everything that they did, obviously, but they really focused on making that first, those first 50 customers super happy, delighted, understanding what, you know, what they want, um, and then scaling from there. So um, even, you know, two and a half years in, the, the main focus has been um, uh, supply, getting lots of listings on the site, because we know that the more listings, the more choice for the user, also the more pages on our site, the better SEO, that kind of thing. And then the higher side of the marketplace is um, uh, uh, lots of, lots of search, search marketing, um, and also PR, which was something that we didn't know um, we didn't know the value of early on. We got some quotes off PR agencies for like four or five grand a month and we're like, ah, <laughs> at the time. Um, and then we figured out we had a really good story and a unique product and we found ways to get in national media and tell the story. We, we got some um, uh, success stories like Luke, the, the sharing economy king up the back. He's a, um, a great customer of ours who um, uh, now owns 14 or 15 vans, is it Luke? Yep, um, from one, quit his job, did that. Yeah, pretty good. So let's, let's talk about that a bit because I think this is amazing yeah. when you guys were telling me earlier. So Luke started off as someone who put their, their van on the site. Yeah, so I think, I think the uh, first interaction Luke had with me, I think you can tell me whether I'm wrong, Luke, but it was a fa we did some Facebook ads. There was some, you know, Luke commented, oh, yeah, sounds good. You've got to be careful with insurance and a few other bits and pieces. And, um, you know, he decided to give it a go. He put one camper trailer on that he had personally. Um, you know, got so many bookings that he's like, this is pretty good, I'm gonna go buy another one, and then another one, another one, and you know, now it's sort of grown where he's got, you know, he's had to move out of his home into a commercial premise to house them <laughs> house all. Them all. Wow. Um, he follows and, us around everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and now, you know, he, he talks to other customers that are in a similar boat um, for us and tells them about what he's done and how that's worked and, um, you know, how, how you can do that. Um, and, you know, every week when we deposit money into people's account, we're like, how much money's going to Luke? This is insane. So, um, yeah, no, he's doing a great job. So. That's great. Did you ever envisage that you would have customers kind of forming their own business off we'd the back so. of the We'd hope so. And we, and we realised pretty quick that no matter how, mu how much we tell people that Campify is a great idea and you can do this and that, it's never going to be quite as powerful as someone like Luke getting on the phone to them who owns vans, has done the process, you know, can give them a, you know, a clear vision of what it's going to be like and whether they should do it. And, then, and at the end of the day, with our owners, it's such a big trust thing. Um, so uh, all, that's, all that's important and it's been super valuable and it's helped, helped us get that PR, um, you know, highly valuable PR um, that we otherwise would have had to pay thousands for. I think when, when we first started, you know, I kind of had the vision of, it would just be a community of people that would just share stuff. Yeah. Um, but then we kind of quickly realised that they want more than that. You know, they want something that, that helps them um, you know, get what they're looking for out of it, which is you know, to pay off their camper. Yeah. So. Mm. And, and, and that's, probably, that's a good point too. Like, um, something that I guess a bit of a light bulb um, flicked for, for me when we did, a, um, we did a bit of a session, like a user journey session with our designers early on. And, and they really drilled down into what are our customers, ideal customers pain points. And because coming from, from our perspective, we're like, oh, everyone will want to, this is everything with the caravans, it's sharing and yeah. whatever. But we, when we really drilled down, we, we realized that um, a lot of people have um, some regret, some guilt, because they've talked their partner into buying a big investment and sitting there doing nothing. And, and so we really just need to, needed to uh, tailor our messaging around that. So earning income, you know, offsetting costs, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, definitely. And uh, what are the metrics that you focus on from a marketing perspective? What's kind of the, the main focus areas? Uh, yeah, so our, our, what we'd probably call call a North Star metric is listings um, or bookings as well. But um, 
the more for us, the more listings we have on our site. Um, again, the, the more pages on our site, the more choice, and um, and probably the other the other part of it is um, uh, engagement metrics of those owners. So early on, we thought we just wanted anyone with a caravan to list, but then we realised when some people weren't committed or um, weren't really into it and weren't getting back to people, um, you know, that's not the kind of person we want. We we want someone who's going to represent Campify in a way that gives the end user a great experience. So that's another one probably. For me, it's um, CPA. So, yep. you know, basically. Uh, per, per customer booking effectively? Well, is depending. That? So listing, cost per, cost per listing or cost per booking. So, um, you know, I, we kind of realised um, probably in the last 18 months, 12 months that uh, really what we need to do is just drive down a CPA um, and maximise um, the, the use of those, both, <laughs> both sides of that, the bookings and the listings. And uh, so to the point now, when Dave comes to me with some ridiculous idea, I say, well, I don't care what you do, as long as that CPA goes down, you can do what you like. So, Can you give us an idea of what your cost per acquisition kind of was and where you're aiming to go or any, any figures yeah, to so give I think us an idea? 12 months ago, an owner listing was about $58 an owner listing. About that? Yeah, it was yeah. And you know, now I think we're down to about 14 12. Yeah, it, it, it depends. Like, for example, we're in a bit of a cycle at the moment where we've just invested a heap of money into cheap Harrigan and some TV ads in regional areas. Um, and so if we looked at that as a cost per acquisition sort of metric, it doesn't look that, that, that great. However, we know that, um, we hope, um, that um, in those regional areas especially, um, those, pe those you know, three people in Rockhampton that list their van and get a heap of bookings because the demand's so high um, will tell 10 friends and, and yes. so on and so forth. And that's something we've seen. The branding um, ROI. Yeah, it, it's yeah. like it's, uh, I'd love to just know exactly how many um, people we've got from our PR stories and stuff. It's tricky, but we just know that that stuff has, has, has helped. Um, and then the CPA over time, you know, when we don't have to do TV ads, we've got the awareness, we'll obviously come down with the digital stuff, so. Great, can you tell us a bit about that ad? And I know you've been filming other ads as well, so what is your kind of plan in terms of advertising? Where has it been shown and, and how did you get Paul involved? Yeah, so um, uh, Paul, we kind of knew for a, through a friend, you know, he's obviously, a, Newcastle's a very small town, but, um, you know, everybody knows everybody. Um, so we kind of went to Paul and said, you know, we want to we want to build a brand association with you um, and to be honest we can't pay you what you're worth right now but let's give it a go and then in you know, three years we can pay you what you're worth. Yeah. Um, so um, he was willing to, to have a take a punt on that um, and work with us on that um, and we decided to do it because we knew how valuable our NRMA relationship had been to customers. So. Um, that trust that people had put in the NRMA brand, it's the fifth most trusted brand in Australia. Um, so for us to have that association with them uh, was very powerful. So, and this is now the next evolution of that. Paul's done you know, a huge amount of work with NIB um, and we, we looked at uh, how the NIB ads tested in different areas. So the conversion rate of those ads, for example, in Adelaide, where you know, Paul's a rugby league player, he's in the NRL footy show, he's not well known in Adelaide, but those ads convert really well. Um, so we looked at that and, and looked at what he could bring to that um, uh, relationship and, and how that message would get across with him evolved. Um, and then we looked at where have he really struggled to get customers and get distribution. Uh, and then we looked at where was the highest concentration of RVs. And so we kind of knitted all that data together and went, okay, if we run some TV ads in these regions, we think they'll convert really well. Um, they're relatively low cost and we know that there's no competition. So there's no Apollo, there's no anybody else in that region uh, will be the ones in that market that can dominate that market. Great, fantastic. And what about the other videos that you're recording more recently? Are they? Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a few different variations. So um, as you can see, that one before was more targeted at owners and, and educating you know, what you could earn and that kind of thing. But um, uh, stories, so member stories. Uh, we've got different personas of you know our ideal people that we we would like on the platform, uh, and and we've done videos with each of those people telling their story. I don't know if you've seen the Airbnb ones of you know it feels like home, or they're talking about their local area and why why they're listing on Airbnb and what 
they get out of it more so than saying, hey, I earned $10,000 this year. It's like, oh, I, can, I can now afford to go on an extra holiday with the family or it pays for my insurance or whatever. The key thing is that um, Campify is not about us. We're the enabler. It's about the customer. They're the stars. So, you know, we're trying to tell their story and tell, you know, how they use the platform, what they do, you know, how they provide experiences to, to, um, to the hirers um, and, you know, get people um, uh, involved from both sides of the market that want to want to be a part of it. Yeah, fantastic. What's been the most effective channel for growth from a marketing perspective? Uh, it, it depends on what side of the marketplace we're talking about. For hirers, it's been SEO, Google, um, by, by far. Um, there's just so much demand. Uh, through a, a few ways, so um, through our listings, people typing in localised search terms, so we have tourism pages and that kind of thing, as well as the listings, so we're coming up in search, but um, strategic content, um, even for the owner acquisition side of things. This is, this is a challenge we had early on. Nobody knew to type in the Google, hire out my caravan. So we had to think, well, what are caravan owners typing in the Google? And one example of, of that is, um, I think you wrote the article in Caravan Renovations, didn't you? Actually, yeah. I was actually, um, I... We need to clean that one up. I think I was, um, <laughs> I think, uh, I can't remember, I had some brainwave about a way to create lots and lots of content quickly. So we created like, let's do something on caravan reno renovation so I could do like a, basically a list post but in pictures. Right. So we could create like, you know, 50 pictures and, get, and put tips on, on them. Yeah. And then that became a, an article mm -hmm. out of that. So, so that's an example of um, like a top of the funnel piece of content that we've captured someone who's, someone who's typed in caravan renovations is fairly likely to own the caravan or want to get one. So we're ranking really well in Google, they find the article that they want to read, but within that is obviously education about what we are in the calculator yeah. call to action. So when we figured out that work, then we've scaled that a bit and yeah. written lots of content around um, not necessarily direct, you know, what our owners are searching for that's relevant to us, but other stuff that, that is relevant and has been effective. We did one on uh, caravan storage where we re-ranked the <coughs> 50 best caravan storage companies in Australia. Yeah. and it, ranks the house down and you know you type in caravan storage and pretty much we're in the top five um, and what that did for us was heaps of caravan storage places would ring us and say can I please be on your article and so we'd go yeah sure no worries tell us about your business and who have you who are your customers and yeah how can we how can we work with you so uh, and the other one would be uh, probably PR PR was really strong but in spikes and then Facebook ads, of course. Uh, for us, Facebook groups is really powerful because in the caravanning community, there's all heaps of groups of just really passionate camping fanatics. So um, tactically, um, what, we, what we often will do is, you know, we're all engaged with those groups personally and we're following them and stuff. And whenever we have relevant content, like the storage article or the uh, best holiday parks on the East Coast article or whatever, or videos, we'll just drop them in there and, and that gets us a lot of traffic as well. So. Um, it's another, probably, oh, partner's email list. <laughs> I want to give it as much as possible. Yeah, so are you leveraging those partnerships much from a marketing perspective now? And is NROMA still involved in that side of things? Or? Yeah, we have like a, a wide and varied strategy um, on um, partnerships. And, and probably like the best example I can give on that is how we've taken our learnings over the last sort of 18 months and then have now applied that to the UK market. Yes. Um, so, um, no, I'm not um, so we've, we deliberately went and recruited somebody in the market who was very w well connected, um, who could from day one reach out to his enormous database that he had, um, you know, of two and a half thousand contacts that worked in that industry and say, hey, I now work at Camplify, this is what we do, I'd love to partner with you, how can we do some content together? Um, and things have just rolled on and on from there. Great, so that was actually my next, next topic to talk about your international expansion and the UK is something that you've just launched in recently. Um, so obviously that was one of the first steps that you kind of took. What made you decide to tackle the UK market as the next step? Yeah, so um, it, it, we wanted to find a market that um, was English speaking, um, had a very similar culture to us so we could roll things out at a reasonable scale without having you know, too much invested in it. Um, that had, was a bigger market than ours um, and wasn't New Zealand because it was too close. 
So, um, you know. Ticks all those other boxes. Pretty much that, well, that, not, that was not the UK. So, <laughs> um, you know, they're about, um, you know, in Australia we have roughly 550,000 RVs. Um, they have close to a million um, and, uh, you know, double the population we have. Um, and there really wasn't a competitor doing a great job over there. There was lots of people who were already doing this kind of activity, but not through a platform. Um, so we said, well, we can go on and fill that gap. And just to clarify that, the key benefit using a platform versus doing it on your own is what? So uh, safety, security, um, you know, you don't have to worry if um, someone cancels on you at the last minute, you don't have to worry about insurance problems, uh, you don't have to worry about, you know, what do I do if someone trashes this? Um, from a, a higher side, you know, I don't have to worry that what I'm going to turn up to is not what I it was in the photo. Yeah. This thing actually does exist, and I'm not, you know, driving to yeah. a paddock somewhere. Um, <laughs> and yeah, a whole range of different things. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, we just make it so much easier for both sides of the marketplace. Have you had any horror stories about it from an owner's perspective? No, no. Um, you know, th there's been some uh, damage things that have occurred, but um, really there've been minor incidents and total accidents, and you know, both sides of have understood that that's occurred and, and um, made sure that uh, we've looked after both sides of the market to, to ensure that it went smoothly. Great. And what stage is your UK expansion in at the moment? Uh, so right now we're in owner acquisition mode. Um, so um, we, we launched kind of towards the end of their season so that we could focus on acquiring customers and not too many people would be interested in the hiring right now. Yeah. Um, although, you know, we still have been approached lots at the moment to do it anyway. Um, but uh, the parks over there shut down um, the 1st of December okay. uh, until uh, around the middle of January. So, you know, we've- a bit of time to, to get yeah. those owners on board. Exactly. Fantastic. And are you finding that similar strategies are working well over there <coughs> to what has worked here? Yeah, the, um, the key difference over there is that there's a lot more volume. There's a lot more communities or, and email lists and, and caravanning clubs and that kind of thing that we can partner with and leverage. Uh, and Facebook groups and that kind of thing. So it's, it's been really uh, a really similar approach, just scaled quicker, it's, got, it's, it's really taken off. Great. Uh, one of the audience questions was, what was the difference between that first platform you had and what you've created now? And oh, what did you do differently? Yeah, um, I'm sure it's evolved so a lot. From a higher point of view, to actually sign up and create an a, account <coughs> profile, you had to answer 65 questions. Um, it was a type form though, it was really fancy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and now you just need an email and a password to start. Um, you couldn't see any listings until you actually completed an account. That's because we didn't have many, many listings, so we just wanted to capture as many customers as possible. Um, but then, uh, like, you know, communication between the two parties was difficult. Um, it looked terrible. Um, and just little things like, you know, uh, it wasn't really mobile responsive. Um, it kind of was okay on mobile, but not great. Um, and just the UX was, was, was pretty ordinary. Yeah, fair enough. Now, what's your definition of success for the business? And I, I suppose talk us through what that looks like over the next, you know, five years or however long that might be. Yeah, well, I think, you know, the immediate thing we're trying to uh, get to uh, here in Australia is to be the biggest rental fleet in Australia. Um, so. We're not too far off that now. You know, I, th I think probably in the next six months we'll get there. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, looking at how we can scale into uh, multiple countries um, with an, a base of operations here um, and really, you know, scale the business at a significant rate. Great. And what, what's next on your international expansion list after the UK? Yeah, so we're looking at a couple of different country options at the moment. Um, you know, we've looked at, you know, we've probably got 10 that we're looking at, uh, we'll probably, you know, pick three um, and, and sort of roll those out uh, over the next, um, you know, 12 months. And will you need to raise any more funding to do that or are you right with where you're at at the moment? Yeah, we will. We'll, we'll raise again um, some some, sometime yeah. next year. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. <laughs> but someone here may, you never yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Um, tell us about some of the biggest challenges you've had to date in your journey. Um, I think the biggest challenge we had was insurance. Um, so, 
Uh, insurance companies in Australia, from my experience, uh, don't understand the sharing economy. Uh, they probably do a little bit better now than they did two years ago. Um, they don't understand, or it's too much work in the Australian economy for the amount of people we have to write a custom policy. Um, so you have to try and uh, make something fit that isn't perfect. Um, and there's just a, uh, there's no entrepreneurial thinking in that space. Um, so um, to be able to find and get a product that actually covers those people um, at a reasonable rate on demand when they need it um, was, the, I think, our biggest challenge. And how did you solve that? What was the, you know? We spoke to lots and lots of insurance companies. <laughs> yeah. um, I think every single insurance company, probably. Um, and every time we spoke to them, we tried to find out what their problem was, like why they would not consider this yeah. and, and what was the, the concern. And then we basically just, like we did with our customers, we just solved every single problem along the way till we got to the last insurance company that said, I've got no reason to say no. Great, fantastic. Um, is the US on your expansion market plans? Yeah, look, it, it's, um, it's obviously the big, biggest RV market in the world. Um, it, um, you know, I think there's about five point, well, I know for a fact that they sell 580,000 RVs a year. So that's more than the Australian total, total every year. Double, yeah, so, um, you know, I think that definitely we will, we will look at some point as to what we can do in that market. Yeah, great. What is your culture like at Campify? Someone wants to know if you go camping together. <laughs> we haven't yet, maybe for the Christmas party this year. <laughs> no, it's really, really, it's, it's very fun. Uh, we, we all work like super, super hard, but it's, it's quite relaxed. Um, and, and, you know, I think that's been a real key. Like we all enjoy working, working with each other. We basically um, just take the piss out of each other all day, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. We have, a, we have a challenge at every if anyone's thinking of joining us anytime, uh, we, ha we have an international team, so we have a challenge where every new team member has to eat a full um, spoonful of Vegemite. Oh, nice. So. <laughs> How's that go down? Uh, Tough, yeah. probably. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back, is there anything you'd do differently if you were doing it again now? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, obviously we've learnt a stack about marketing. Um, so um, we just had to test a heap of things before we actually worked out what worked properly. So. Um, you know, that, that would be um, something obviously we would, we would refine in hindsight. Um, I think that we kind of, um, we didn't exactly know, or we really didn't know what we were doing to start with, to be honest, like, you know, we, we built this thing on the back of a pitch deck, we just kind of yeah. took some money and went, let's give it a go. So, um, you know, I think that um, we now understand a hell of a lot more about um, the strategy of customer acquisition, uh, what an investor actually wants to see from a metric point of view, um, how, to, how to get to those metrics, um, you know, how to actually deliver piece by piece along that, that road um, so that we can actually um, you know, achieve that, uh, that growth that we're looking at. The other thing is really understanding our, what our perfect customer is, who our perfect customer is and doing stuff to, you know, that they want. Um, so as I said before, we thought we just wanted anyone with a caravan, but now we know they're likely family, they've got a certain type of um, caravan, um, they usually own a house because you own a house then you, then you buy a van. So uh, early on it was a bit more of a scattergun approach, which we probably, or well, we did change for the UK. Yeah. And what's it been like running a startup out of Newcastle? I mean, I suppose we constantly hear about the challenges of running a startup out of Australia. Um, outside of a capital city, I'm sure there, there's some other challenges as well. How have you found that journey and has that impacted you from investors and partners? I think it's, it's good and bad. Um, I think the good things about it are that, um, you know, you can, uh, rent's cheap, um, cost of living's cheap, uh, or cheaper than capital city. Um, so you can you get better value out of your employees generally. Um, you can you know stretch your funding a little bit further. Um, you can you know live 
uh, within 10 minutes of the office, um, and which is also five minutes from the beach. Um, and also, um, you know, myself having worked in lots of businesses in Newcastle, I have a really good network in Newcastle. So when I wanted to start fundraising, I was like, okay, I know, I know who to go and talk to to be my angel investors uh, to find those. So um, from that point of view, um, you know, it's a, it's a great, great spot to be. Um, you know, I think, I think the challenging part is um, uh, going into a global market is um, transport links. Um, so, you know, to fly to the UK, I have to either drive two hours to Sydney or fly to Brisbane and then go to, uh, to you know, overseas. So that's, that's a challenge. Um, being able to be um, in a community is, of, of startups is a challenge, although that's growing fast in Newcastle at the moment. Um, but to be able to go to lots of events and stuff like this that's on, um, they don't happen very often in Newcastle, so, so that, that's also you know, a bit of a, a problem. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Okay. Um, have there been any projects throughout the journey that have unexpectedly taken a lot of your time? Obviously the insurance side of things was a big one. Is there anything else that's kind of taken you by surprise along the way? When I was in t-shirts. <laughs> You should tell <laughs> <laughs> these, see these shirts we're wearing? So Justin, it had to be his, his job to organise the t-shirts. And, he, and how, many, how many sets of shirts have oh, you organised? Probably ten. Yeah, <laughs> at least five or six. And they, none of them would fit anyone. They're all crappy. And we finally kind of settled. So that took a fair bit that of time. That was my favourite one, that one up there. The share the caravan one. But oh, no one gracious. else liked that one, so... There was uh, these ones yeah. that were blue with green writing. You couldn't even see what they yeah, said. Yeah. Terrible. Uh, um, uh, so, some other things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, some other things like, you know, just like finding the right tools to use. Um, so, um, you know, like we would go through, try, we tried maybe four or five different email marketing systems yeah. before we found the right one that was... Yeah, so Aussie startup um, and good pricing, uh, knocks, uh, features knock it out of, the, out of the park. So those kind of things, you know, just like, you know, you try, ma start with MailChimp and then you do this and you do that. And, yeah. you know, um, just takes a lot of time to sort of find the right one that fits for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Um, there was a question from the audience about customer service and having that service from South Africa and the Philippines yeah. and how that's worked for you. Any, yeah. any tips or experiences? and you know, what the customer experience has been like from that too. Yeah, so um, our first two customer service people we employed uh, in the Philippines, we did it direct with, um, what's the website called? Uh, Online Jobs. Yeah, Online Jobs PH. Um, the first person, uh, we probably put, I don't know, two months worth of time into her and one day she just never came back. So we just lost her altogether. I don't know what happened to her. Um, the second person, um, she was a little bit better, um, and she was, you know, she was good at um, ser customer service. Um, and then we just kind of found out, like, she was, you know, looking after three kids at home, which she didn't tell us about. And um, you know, she'd go for a couple of days where we'd be like, oh, where is she? She's not working, and she'd be at some thing or, yeah. Anyway, so um, it it was a real challenge doing that and then we, we finally found a, a BPO that we um, uh, was really good for us, good fit um, and so we w I actually went over there, met with the BPO, looked at their facilities, talked to them about what I wanted, um, their recruitment strategy, how they were going to find someone for us, um, you know they went and recruited the team for us um, and then you know I go over there regularly and actually spend time with the team, train them you know, help them to understand what's the difference between a caravan and a camper trailer, you know, yeah. all that kind of basic stuff. Yeah. Um, and, you know, actually get them to understand our customer. Yeah. Um, you know, I spend, you know, a week at a time there with them doing customer service, you know, me on the phone to customers, them listening in, working out how to do that, um, you know, going back and reviewing the call and uh, all that kind of stuff. So we did lots of training with them. Yeah. Um, so you can't beat that kind of hands-on yeah. time. Yeah. Um, and then you know, using tools like Slack so that they can constantly ask stuff to everybody in the business about what should I do with this, what should I do with that, um, and create that channel where they can all talk together 
and, and uh, on that. Um, South Africa has been um, uh, excellent. They're really, really high quality um, uh, people in South Africa. Uh, I've spent lots of time uh, in Joburg. I used to have an office over there when I worked in my previous role. I had a team, a team of six people over there. And so when I decided that we wanted people to uh, service our customers uh, in the afternoons and nighttime, time, uh, because lots of our people, uh, our owners have got full-time jobs and then they come home of an afternoon and, and do stuff. Um, I said, well, let's, let's go find someone over there because it was a good time zone. Um, and I knew that um, companies like uh, IINet um, and lots of ser internet service providers build teams over there. Um, so I decided we'll, we'll, we'll put an ad on LinkedIn um, for a customer service person. We had uh, 7,000 applicants. Um, so that took a while to whittle down to one person. Um, yeah, um, so, but you know, the, the quality of the people, um, you know, with uh, univer universities over there are hot, very high quality. Um, you know, we've got uh, marketing degree people um, who, you know, I would rate as high as anybody I could employ here. Um, and they just do an amazing job. Fantastic, oh, that's a really good story. Um, have you considered expanding into other marketplaces, sharing economy marketplaces? I guarantee someone in this room will ask me about boats tonight because I get asked every single time I go to something. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, look, I think that um, we actually, we had a, a potential investor um, who was a, a corporate uh, who really wanted to invest in us for our platform uh, because they wanted to build a marketplace for other stuff. Yeah. Um, it's, we, we built our platform so it was kind of um, unit agnostic. You could you know, have any unit of measure and, um, and anything. So th there's always opportunities to do that in the future when you know, we kind of hit our... Um, so you didn't end up going or getting that investor involved? No, we didn't. Um, we just felt as though it would be a distraction doing that. Okay, yeah, fair enough. And just as a finishing note, would, what advice would you give to someone else here today trying to build a two-sided sharing economy marketplace? Have lots of money. Yeah. <laughs> um, focus on supply and the right type of supply yeah. and, and focus on whatever marketing you're doing, um, just focus on one thing at a time and yeah. I get think that right. The other thing that we did, um, which was in hindsight I think a mistake, was just went, we're national and we'll take anything from anywhere. Yeah. Um, and I think when you're trying to build a marketplace, it's good if you can try and um, prove it in a little marketing ground first, yeah. um, and then work out in that sample size, how can I do this more effectively at, at a bit more scale? Yes. Um, so that would be my advice to start with, is find a, an area or a little tiny niche inside your niche yeah. um, that you can start with. Um, and then, you know, don't try and um, don't try and do too much to start with. Just work out how you can get those first um, 50 listings, and then how can you you can help those customers to work that as hard as possible, yeah. um, and then you can continue to grow. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. That's gone really quick, but I'd like you to uh, all join me in a round of applause for Justin and Dave. Thank you so much. Thank you.